I have an ask the pastor question, but the person that asked is not here, so we will put that off for another day. Open with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. <clears throat> We're working through discipleship, and in the process of talking about discipleship, <clears throat> we've talked about what are we to be discipled in. And I thought, what, what better place to start than what Scripture tells us are the elementary truths, the elementary doctrines, <coughs> the foundation of what we believe. So, in the writing of Hebrews... The writer wants to share with them some things, but he, he, he's got a problem. They're not ready. And, and I think that's a problem that is indicative of the church in America. Because we don't challenge ourselves. We're not challenged to know God beyond a passing, hey, how are you? We're not challenged to examine the depths and the richness of His Word. We, we're content with just the rudimentary understanding. And so the author, I think, got inspired to write across the ages to speak to us. So I'm going to actually back up into chapter 5. Starting in verse 11, this is the, the same passage we've been working out of for several weeks. We'll be here for a few more weeks until we cover each point. Okay, so starting in verse 11, chapter 5, it says, About this we have much to say. Now, about this, he's talking about Jesus as the high priest. The high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Which, for those of you that don't know... The priesthood came through Aaron's line. The high priest was a, a blood relative, a blood descendant of Aaron. But the writer of Hebrews writing to Jews, he's saying we have a, a better high priest. This is, this is ground shaking for the Jews. Because they have millennia of Aaron as the high priest. And the line of Aaron. And, and now here he's saying, there is a high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Now for those of you that, that don't remember, Melchizedek was a priest unto God that Abraham came across after he had rescued Lot. And he gave unto Melchizedek a tenth of all that he had gathered when he rescued Lot. Now, the, the author of Hebrews is, is trying to make a point about Jesus being of the line of Melchizedek and a high priest of that line, superseding the high priesthood of Aaron. Okay, and he wants to get into this, but, but listen to what he says. He says, about this, we have much to say. And it is hard to explain, not because the issue is hard, not because it's all that complex, but since you have become dull of hearing. Oh, what an accusation. Being dull of hearing. Christian and I went and got our hearing checked. <laughs> because each of us believed the other was suffering from difficulties in hearing. <laughs> And so we went down, and we just had a very quick, like, 15-minute thing done. And we were both right. But I knew my problem. I've had the same problem since I was five years old. She was without excuse. <laughs> and we would get into these arguments, because whether she told me and I didn't hear, or as I tend to phrase it, she just didn't tell me, or whether I told her and she just didn't hear, or as she views it, I didn't tell her. We both had an issue. We're, we're both getting hard of hearing. Okay? Now, my, my problem's not with my ears. So, ha! My problem's with my brain. 
I got a unique brain. Now when a lot of people talk when there's a lot of noise, it just gets jumbled in my head, it's mush. Okay, so if I'm standing in a group of people and you're talking to me and I'm not responding, it's not personal. I have no idea what you're saying. I'm waiting for the interpretation, okay? But what an accusation that he says you become dull of hearing, meaning that they're not open to hear what God would say to them, okay? For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their power of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Okay, so now what's coming next is kind of where we're dwelling. He says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instructions about washings, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> and laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Okay, so now he's laying what he sees through the divine inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit. He's saying that these are foundational. And, and it's good that you know these. But... You've never progressed beyond them. You're stuck. Now, at the church in America, in the Church of America, we have some churches that teach this well. We have some churches that don't even touch on these. I don't want to stand before God and see that any of you came in ignorance because I failed to teach. Okay? So I, I get as bare bones as we can, and, and by God's grace, I want to get as deep into the Word as we can. Okay? Because this is like a gold mine. Okay? Everything in here is of value. And you can't dig without finding gold. And the deeper you dig, you just find more gold. It's, it's, it's more. And so you, you can't look at it and go, oh, well, you know, I've got gold flakes, so it's not as good as the gold nugget. Well, it's still gold. So at the foundation of our faith, the, the, the elementary doctrines, repentance. Now, I told you a couple weeks ago, each of these elements is knitted together into a whole. You can't really take them individually. Because they all intertwine and they work together <coughs> in the work that God has done. So, we have a foundation of repentance from dead works. Now, what are dead works? Well, anything that's not done unto God. So, you mean when I'm cooking dinner, that's dead works? Well, I don't know. Are you doing it unto God? I'll tell you what, man. You, you, can, you can praise God through the mundaneness of, night, of life. You can give God glory in the, the simplest things of life because it's all about your attitude. It's all, it's all about what you're looking at. For those of you that know Christy, you know that cooking dinner is one of her not favorite things. Cooking anything is one of her not favorite things. But, she can choose to let that become a gripe, a grumbling, a dishonor before God. Or she can choose, as she often does, putting on worship music and praising Him and listening to that worship as she's doing supper. See, it's all about your attitude. How are you approaching it?
foundation of repentance, and we talked about repentance, what was, was uh, the understanding of repentance? It's to have your mind changed. That you are introduced to the truth, the Holy Spirit comes in, and where you used to think this, now you think this. Sometimes it's instantaneous. Boom. There are things that God has just, just like lightning from heaven smote me in the head. And I, my, my thinking was changed in a moment. There are other things that have taken me years to be changed. Okay? But then we go on to a faith towards God. We spent two weeks talking about faith and I still didn't finish all my notes. Because I, I don't think you can ever finish talking about faith. But moving on, he says, and of instruction about washings. Now that's where we're going to dwell today. Does anybody have a translation that reads differently there? What does it say? Doctrine of baptism. Doctrine of baptism. Does anybody have anything different? Cleansing rites. Cleansing rites. Interesting. Does anybody have anything different? You said doctrine of baptism? Baptisms. Baptisms. Christy, you said cleansing rites. Cleansing rites. And, and in here, it says instruction about washings. Now, I, I don't know what your particular translation reads, but depending on how this is interpreted, it could mean a whole bunch of things. And yet, we know that the author is speaking specifically to one thing. Now, I'm going to put our technical crew on the spot. I put a, uh, in Dropbox, I put a slideshow. It says Mikvahs. Okay? If you would pull that up and then go ahead and put it up on the screen. Um, who was this written to specifically? Hebrews. The Jews. The Jews that had come to Christ. Okay? Now, now, does that mean that it's not for us? No. Well, yeah, of course it's for us. But we have to adjust our thinking because we were not raised in a culture of Judaism. And so we need to understand what the author was trying to say, and then we need to see how God would speak to us. Okay, so do we have that there? Go ahead and go to the first one. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, we find that there are several places where the Jews are required to wash, to cleanse themselves. Okay, uh, I've, I've got a list. Um, if you would like to see this list after, come talk to me. I'll make you a copy. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. Uh, when we were in Israel, just about every location we went, somewhere there was a mikvah. A mikvah is the ritual bath that the Jews would use to cleanse themselves. Now, interestingly enough, that there are no mikvahs prior to 1 century B.C. Okay? Now, I believe the reason for that is because prior to that, they used, as God had commanded, they used living water. Living water was water that flowed. So water that was in a river or a creek, uh, water from a lake that would, would come in fresh and go out. Uh, you, you couldn't use rain except under certain circumstances because the water had to flow. And when rain falls, it drops and it stops. Okay? So, so today... Uh, there are still mikvahs in use for Judaism, uh, and they have very strict guidelines according to uh, Jewish tradition, not scripture, but Jewish tradition as to what's allowed. Okay? But consistently in the mikvahs, and you'll see in some of the other pictures, there are stairs, a, a series of stairs leading down to a pool. Now at the bottom of the stairs, there's usually a broad step, and then uh, you step off into deeper water. Now that broad step is for shorter people. Because the idea is to wash, not drown. Okay? So, the Jews being very clear in their thinking, when they built these, you have the steps going down, and if you're short, stop at the last step. 
Okay, if you're taller, go down. Because the understanding here is that you are washing the whole body. As a matter of fact, in, in Jewish tradition, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't even go in with braided hair. You had to unbraid your hair because everything needed to be washed. And if you went in with braided hair, some of the braid inside might not get washed. So they would have to, there, there are all kinds of rules. Okay? So in the mikvah, this right here is in the synagogue uh, in Capernaum. It's actually in the synagogue. You know, like we have some churches that have baptismals in them. That's what they had. And you come into the synagogue, and right there on the right as you come in, there's the mikvah. There's the ritual bath for them to get clean. Okay? And, and the stairs going down are actually separated. And, and you go down on one side, defiled, and then you are washed and you come up on the other side clean. Okay, now in some of these, you're not going to be able to see it very clearly. Uh, go ahead and go to the next one. But you see here, there's that little dividing line in there. And if you look at the bottom, you'll see there's a, a step for shorter people. Okay, this is, this is not actually the mikvah at Qumran, but it's, it's a duplicate. Okay, now I had a, another picture of the actual one, but it was kind of hard to see because of the sun and the, the shade. So I just decided to put this one up. But you would go down on the right, you would wash, and you'd come back up on the left. Okay, why is this important? Well, let me continue. Let's go to the, I think this is the last one. Uh, Masada. Does anybody know what Masada is? Masada is the last place of Jewish culture before they went into exile until 1948. That was the last bastion. It was a, a fortress built on top of a plateau. And there, the last of the Jewish zealots and some of the Essenes from Qumran and the surrounding area fled when Jerusalem was destroyed. And, and the Romans laid siege to it and actually built an incredible rampart up and broke the wall in. But, but at the top of this fortress, there's a mikvah. Because even when you're on guard duty and even when you're in war, there's a call to be clean. Okay? And, and actually, I think there's one more because we went to the southern steps. Okay? Now, when you went up to the temple, if you can't approach the temple from the south, uh, they have steps. It's really cool because they have steps of different size. Yes? Were women allowed to do it? Yes. As a matter of fact, at times they were required to do it. Um, so the, the steps would be different depths and different heights. Okay? Because you did not rush into the presence of God. You came with solemnity. And they would have certain steps that were actually broad so that you could stop and stand and pray one of the Psalms of Ascent because you were going up to the temple. But at the southern steps, there's mikvahs. There's the, the pool to get clean. Okay? So why is this important? This is important because the literal translation of what we just read is baptismos didache. You're like, well, okay, what does that mean? Well, baptismos is where we get the literal transliteration, baptism. Okay, we didn't, we didn't translate baptism. We just stole the word. Okay, so when we say, oh, we, we, we were baptized, we're actually taking a transliterated word. What we're really saying, if we translate it, is we were immersed. We were dumped. We were dipped. Okay, and baptismos is the, the, the washing to be purified. And then didache is teaching. So what the word literally translated is baptism teachings. Okay? So here's where they were stuck. There were four places that we know that the Jews had to wash. Okay? Number one, a Jewish woman was required to wash at the end of menses, whether having had a, a baby or just monthly. In order to be clean, she had to wash. Okay? That was directed in Leviticus chapters 12 and 15. Okay? 
Reason number two, Jewish men. Now this one, there's, there's actually a series, okay? And I'm, I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly. Carrie, this was after a man had nocturnal emissions, whether with his wife or unknown. And he had to wash, okay? He had to wash and wait till evening to be considered clean again, all right? Uh, second one, Zav, abnormal bodily emissions. Stuff that comes out that's not supposed to. You had to wash. You had to get washed and wait till evening, and then you would be considered clean. Zaraf. Skin conditions. Now, in, in the Old Testament, and, and because of the way they translated the Septuagint, they used a general term that we have as leprosy. Okay? But, but leprosy was not the only thing. It was any kind of skin condition that met these requirements. So psoriasis would have been a skin condition that would prevent you from coming into worship in the temple. And you had to be cleansed before you could come before God. Okay? So any kind of skin condition where in the Old Testament you will see leprosy, that doesn't just mean Lepers. It means anybody that had a skin condition that met these certain requirements as laid out in Leviticus. Okay? Um, if you came into contact with someone who had met these conditions, okay? Somebody had psoriasis and sat in a chair and then got up and gave you their chair, guess what? You became unclean and you needed to go wash and purify yourself, okay? Um, this is why in, in some cultures you see that the women actually have a place for that time of the month and they would go out and sleep in that place so that they would not defile anyone in the house, okay? Uh, that's how serious this was to them, okay? You, you come up and you touch somebody that has one of these conditions, you become unclean as well. You getting tired? There's more, okay? There's more. A Cohen. A Cohen, a priest, being consecrated was required to wash. So when the priest would come to be consecrated, they had to wash. The Cohen Gadol, the high priest, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, he had to wash before he could take the blood in to the Holy of Holies. He had to be clean. The Kohen who performed the red heifer sacrifice. What's the red heifer? Does anybody here know the significance of the red heifer? I know Dennis and Jeannie do because they've already shared with me. That's how I know. <laughs> Okay, so Dennis and Jeannie, keep your hands down. The red heifer is, is very significant in, in the law because the red heifer was taken outside of the city gates on the Mount of Olives and was sacrificed and was burned. And then the ashes were taken and they were used in the process to cleanse people. Okay? The red heifer is a huge deal because it had to be a pure red cow. And they found one. Lost for centuries, and now they found one. One step closer to the temple being rebuilt because they have a red heifer with which they can now enact the, the rites of purification. So the Kohen that would sacrifice and the Kohen that would sweep up the ashes, they had to be purified before they could do this. And ironically enough, they had to be purified after they did this. Problem. Don't, don't they have to find the the, uh, the the ark that contains the original ashes of the red heifer so they can mix it with with no okay I had heard that they somewhere. they don't because they can't and if you remember when the second temple was built the ark was never put in it okay. so when Jesus went to the temple the very presence of God came in through the courtyard and into the temple but the presence of God was not in the holy place the most holy place, because the temple wasn't there. It had been removed. So what about the, uh, the ashes of the original? They, they have to do a new one. 
And that's why this is so significant because they have it has to be inspected by rabbis and they have to look over every square inch because even one black or brown hair would disqualify it from being the red heifer. Okay? That's how significant this is. Alright? So, um, after you came into contact with a corpse or in a room where a corpse was, you had to wash and be anointed with the ashes of the red heifer to be cleansed. <clears throat> that must have really stunk for grave diggers and for undertakers. Somebody's got to prepare them. Somebody's got to do the work. Uh, after eating meat from an animal that died naturally. Okay? So you're raising your goats, and you go out one day, and one of your goats is just... Over he went. Okay? It hasn't been ravaged by animals. You are allowed to take that meat and eat it, but because the animal died in a way that was not prescribed, you had to be ritually cleansed before you could worship. You guys getting the idea here that being clean was important to God? Because each one of these is a direct command out of his work. Okay? So... So now we move on to number three. You had to be cleansed if you wanted to join with the Jews. If you were not born a Jew and you wanted to join as a proselyte, you wanted to become Jewish, you were required as a male to be circumcised. There was a, a, an interview process where the rabbis would, would interview you and then if they felt you like you were ready, you would be circumcised. Luckily, women, you did not have to be, just the men. Sucks for you men. Sucks for us. And then you had to be washed. Okay? Now, this, interestingly enough, this is not a requirement in Scripture. This is a requirement that was added in the Talmud, in the teachings of the rabbis. God didn't require the proselytes to come in and, and be circumcised and, and washed. The Jews did. Now, God did require that if you were going to follow in the Jewish faith, those examples that we just read, you had to follow those. But he didn't require that they needed to be circumcised and washed to become part of the Jewish faith. Okay? And, and then the last one... Um, if you had new utensils, especially if you got utensils from Gentiles, or you weren't really sure where they came from, you had to wash them before you could use them. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I was doing all this research, this was exhausting. I mean, I'm going to the bath. I'm coming back from the bath. I'm going to the bath. I'm coming back from the bath. I'm going to the bath. I'm coming back from the bath. Why is this so important? Because God wants to drill in their heads how unclean they are. How unclean we are. And that in order for us to be cleansed without the sacrifice of Christ, without the Messiah, it was an ongoing process. Just like the, the sacrifice had to be done year after year after year. And not even that, that if, if you sinned, there were certain sins that you had to sacrifice in addition to the yearly sacrifices. Because God was trying to get it in their heads how far removed from Him they are and we are. And so they had this daily routine that was a constant reminder that God was holy. And they, in the way they lived, were not. Now God would cover over their sins. That's what the blood of the goats and the sheep were for, the bulls. And they would bathe to, to be cleansed before God, but they always had to keep doing it, didn't they? I mean, newlyweds spent a lot of time taking baths. Because every time they had to be cleansed before God. Thank you. God for the cross. Amen. Because once and for all we have been cleansed. Once and for all we have been cleansed. 
So, we see, coming up to the New Testament, we see that baptism took a little bit of a turn. Can anybody think of an example in baptism in the Old Testament that I didn't discuss? A baptism of, say, a Gentile? Say, a Gentile that was a general and had leprosy? Or some skin condition? Whose name was Naaman? Can anybody think of a, an example like that? Remember that? Yeah, he came and he spoke to the prophet. He wanted to speak to the prophet. The prophet didn't even speak to him. Elisha sent his servant out. To go tell him to go dunk yourself seven times in the Jordan. Okay, we got to see the Jordan. It's not like the waters we have here. Okay? And and Naaman was offended. Uh, if all I've got to do is dip myself seven times, why can't I do it in one of the waters of our country? Why do I got to go to this muddy, dirty little river in Israel? Well, he had a, a servant who was far wiser than he was. And, and the servant said, well, Master, you know, if he had asked you to do this and this or so and so, wouldn't you have done it without thinking? So why would you hesitate here? Go, just do it. And so Naaman went in, and he came out. And he went in, and he came out. And he went in, and came out, and he went in seven times. And guess what happened? He came out clean. He came out cleansed. He came out restored. Okay? Now, by the New Testament, we come into John the baptizer. John the Baptist. Oh, gosh. Where's the time? Next week, we are going to talk about baptism in the New Testament and why this is foundational. This is a foundational doctrine that we need to understand, rooted deep here, why we do this. Okay? So, next week, we will carry on with baptism. We'll wrap that up and we'll move on into laying on of hands the following week.